Hey, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 is where I'm going to go today. And uh, I really appreciate Pastor Justin. Man, if you were here last week, did that dude bring some fire? I'll tell you what, yeah. I can't wait to give him some really hard passages at some point in time, for those of you that were here last week. If he thought that one was hard, wait till he sees the next time that he preaches. No, I thought he did a fantastic job. So thankful for him. He preached on verses 1 through 8 of First Thessalonians 4. If you missed it, man, I would like, like seriously encourage you to grab a watch this week at pinehills.church. It's a great, great message. And so I'm going to preach. It's a very simple, straightforward, and actually shorter message. Before you cheer, hang on. And then the second half of our normally allotted time, I'm going to take some time, and so is Colleen Senestral is going to join me. We just have some things to share with you on the church planting front and the church planting initiative. There are lots of things happening, and we want the church to be in the know and walking with us as these things are happening in real time. So we're going to take about 20 minutes at the end there. So I'm going to shorten the message, but we're still going to, going to talk for 20 minutes and just share all the different irons in the fire that God is doing excited. First Thessalonians 4, if you're new with us, if you're new to the faith, if you're not even sure, just here, just you came as an invite from somebody. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, this, is a, this is a letter. We call it a book, but it was originally written as a letter. A man by the name of Paul, who was, for lack of a better word, a traveling church planner. He traveled all over places and planted churches and then went to another city and did the same thing. Well, he planted a church in a city uh, uh, called Thessalonica. Hence, the term in this letter is First Thessalonians. It's the first of two letters to this small church that he wrote to that he helped to plant. The context is that he planted this church and was only there literally maybe for as few as three or four weeks, and then he was run out of town. There was a riot uh, that was particularly staged against him uh, and Silas, and, and, and they were chased out of town. And so he's been separated from these young um, believers in the faith, and he cares about them, and he cares for their heart, and he cares for their growth in Jesus. And so he writes a letter to help encourage them. And as we're going to see even next week, he writes to answer some questions that they had about people that when they believe in Jesus and then they die, what happens? What, what do we expect? And we're going to unpack that next week. So today is very, very simple, right? He's going to tell us and tell his readers how to have a big impact in just the simplest, simplest ways of daily life. It's it's just so profound, and it's so simple. So let's read. I want to read verses 9 to 12. Today, I'm going to be reading, for those of you that are normally with us, I'm going to be reading from a different version. Typically, I preach from what's called the NIV. Today, I'm going to, I'm going to use the New American Standard. I like the wording. I just think they captured the wording right. So uh, some of you that typically read from the NIV, this will sound just a little different, but I'll have the verse on the screen. All right, so walk with me. Verse 9, this uh, man Paul says, Now as to the love of the brethren, or the brothers and sisters, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. For indeed you do practice it towards all the brethren who are all in Macedonia. That's modern day Turkey. But we urge you, brethren, sorry, that's Asian, this is modern day Greece. But we urge you, brethren, to excel still more. And, now watch this. Talk about simplicity. To make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, to attend to your own business, and work with your hands, just as we commanded you. So that, and notice what he says here, so that you will behave properly toward outsiders and not be in any need. And what he means by outsiders is just simply people that haven't come into the faith Of Jesus Christ yet, but are watching people who claim to have faith in Jesus Christ. So real quick, here's what I want to do. I want to start with verse 12, because I think that informs these simplistic acts of daily life that he writes about. So in verse 12, he says all of these things so that you will behave properly toward outsiders. Now, we could read that in the English. Again, if you're new to this, the the New Testament was written in the Greek language. So we're translating from Greek into English. And while the attempt is to translate word for word, there's also a thing called transliteration where you translate the thought of what the writer was trying to convey. So when he says behave properly, 
This word behave in the Greek uh, carries the understanding of just to walk, the way in, the way in which you walk, um, how I conduct myself in everyday life. The word properly, interestingly enough, only appears in the New Testament three times. It comes from a family of words that carries the idea of an, now watch this, an outward appearance of what is inside. So when you take behave properly together, we gain this understanding that Paul is challenging his readers, listen, to have a kingdom conduct, the kingdom of God, that flows from a changed heart. So I guess what I'm saying is this is more than just um, behave with your actions with an air of modicum. What he's saying is a changed heart results in a changed life. You see that? So that what happens on the outside, now notice, and you're going to like, this is not like, like deep theological, it's just like simple daily life. When an individual has their heart and their mind opened up to see Jesus for who he really is as the risen, resurrected Savior who has truly made the ultimate payment for the very sins that that curse our lives, right? That when that faith happens and he invades our life through faith, that he changes the heart first. And as the heart changes, then the outside or the way in which we act change. And that's what he's talking about here. Like, behave properly. Like, let the outward appearance in the simplest acts of daily life, right, be reflective of the fact that you have a changed heart. So this isn't just behavior modification. Again, for those that might be interested or investigating the claims of Christianity, like, like God isn't into behavior modification. He's into changing hearts, because when our hearts change, our whole life is changed. Like, like everything gets, in a good way, gets flipped upside down. And our purpose and our vision and our goal and our understanding for our very life takes on a whole new meaning. And while it's deeply profound, one of the fastest and quickest ways it plays itself out is in the simple acts of daily life. And that's what Paul's trying to tell his readers here. Remember, these aren't people that have been following Jesus for 15 years, maybe 15 weeks. And he's just helping them understand, like, just walk it out. Just take a step, right? In this act of daily life, behave properly. Let, Let the kingdom... Let the kingdom come out of you. What he's changed and continues to change on the inside, let it just be reflected on the outside. So so let's look at this for a moment. So what exactly is this proper behavior, right? What does it look like in this simple acts of daily life? Again, you're just going to see sometimes, sometimes in simplicity, it's just found some of the greatest, greatest depth, right? So let's go. Verse 9, first of all, he says, it's expressed in how we love one another. How we love one another. The love that he talks about here, we've talked about, he's already mentioned this at least two or three different times. But again, as a reminder, so that we're all tracking together, the love he talks about here is not that emotional, all the feely feels love, right? And you get that. We have that. But this is a love that is a love of choice, It's a love of choosing. I'm choosing to love. We're choosing to love each other, right? Because, again, if if love is rooted and grounded in how we feel, then what happens when you don't feel so lovely towards that person? Then then you're in trouble, or they're in trouble. But this love is a love of choice. It's a Greek word, agape love. It is the love of God, right? So listen, listen. Jesus himself commanded this type of love. He didn't suggest it. He didn't lob it out for our consideration. To those who choose to follow Jesus, here's what he said in both John 13 and John 15. Listen, a new commandment, right? So it's a, command, a new commandment I give you that you love one another. And then he says, as I have also loved you. So Jesus is like, I modeled this kind of love for you. Like to the disciples, I chose to love you. 
For the followers of Jesus, I chose to love you first. And so he says, in this regard, this is how we love one another. Now listen, have you ever considered this? This is why we know he's talking about the love of choice. You can't command an emotion, but you can command a choice. Does that make sense? If we're talking about all the feely feels of love and just the gushiness of love, like how do we even live out this command? Because I'll be honest with you, I, I deeply love some of you. No, I deeply love all of you, but like I don't have all the feely feels. At least, I, I mean, does that sound harsh? Because I don't. I love, but I still love you. But Jesus didn't command the emotion. He commanded the choice. So he says a new commandment. Like, so so he, here's the truth. Every one of us have the capacity to live out the command that Jesus gave us. To love one another. And every one of us have the ability to choose to love each other. And let's just say it like this. When the church chooses to obey this command of Jesus, it is one of the most beautiful things on this planet. And people are just like, how do those people love each other so fiercely? Don't they get on each other's nerves? Yes! (laughs) Yes! Don't those people get mad at each other? Yes! Do those people ever have fights or arguments? Say it with me. Yes! But the love that we're trying to live out is not the feels. It's the choice. So when we fight, we still choose to love. When we argue or disagree, we still choose to love. When we hurt each other, how many of you, let's, I just want to do a quick, how many of you have been hurt by someone at some point in time in your life who has claimed to be a follower of Jesus. I think just about every hand in the room. Even when we're hurt by people, we still have the capacity to follow this command, to choose to love one another. And church, can we not like overlook this? It's not some deep, profound theological knowledge that's gonna draw people to Jesus. It is the simple act of loving one another through thick and through thin. We talked about this in our staff this week, about one of the way, like we're all wired differently, right? And and, in our personalities, in our wiring, and certain personalities click and certain personalities clash. Ooh, that's pretty good. Certain personalities click and certain personalities clash, right? I mean, that's true. And so it's easier at times to get along with certain people the way they're wired and there's other people is really hard to get along with him. Don't be nudging somebody or looking and staring at anybody right now. Just, don't, just look straight, look at me or look at the screen. Don't, just don't do that, all right? But, but this is the thing, like one of the ways we love one another is we just bear with each other, right? Like this is a Colossians 3 thing, bear with one another. Have you ever considered, like, Bearing with one another implies that we will be a a burden to each other at times. And in those moments, we just get to choose to love. And as we do this simple act of loving one another in good times, loving one another in bad times, we have brothers and sisters that go through funerals, and we love them, and we care for them, and we weep with them, and our heart breaks with them. We have brothers and sisters that celebrate momentous decisions in their lives, and we rejoice with them, right? They get married, we rejoice with them. Uh, Just things happen in life, and there's a win, a promotion at work, or a a, a healing touch from me, and we rejoice, and through it all, we just love each other. Do you get the point? It's so simple. You don't have to have a depth. This may overwhelm you and intimidate you. You're so new to the faith, but listen— Don't think that you can't live out the most simplest of commands and just start with loving one another and choosing to love one another and listen and choosing to forgive one another. What a beautiful act of love. So this is pretty straightforward at Jesus. So proper behavior is loving one another. Real quick though, this other one's even less time. Proper behavior is leading a quiet life.
Why are we so awkward with quiet? Some of you are just like, would you say something? Just do, do come on. Last service, we went 10 seconds and some dude yelled. What did he yell out, Nathan? You remember? Amen. Amen. I'm like, no, shh. You're, actually, he was proving my point. <laughs> we're, we're so awkward sometimes, but just quiet. You know why? Listen, hear my heart on this. We have been conditioned by culture to have our lives filled with noise, noise, noise. Well, that'll preach. Right? I mean, it, this, this culture conditions us. And we just open up our mouths and drink from the fire hydrant of noise. Now, understand here, when, when Paul writes, and this word gets translated in the English, quiet, he's not saying silence, per se. The word quiet here, listen, it, it translates, it can be a number of different words. Restfulness. Undisturbed. Settled. Not noisy. Do you see what he's talking about here? Like, th- this is, this proper behavior just leaving a, leading a settled life. And again, culture screams at us from every possible way. So here's the phrase I want to give you, and I want to, I want to give you a practical challenge for this week, all right? Here's the phrase I give you. Eliminate the distractions. That's pretty simple on one hand, right? Now here's a practical challenge for all of us. Okay, maybe you don't get anything else. Maybe you get this. To this week, now for some of you, a very few of you, you already do this. So this will be like, yep, I do that. I'm already on it. But for a vast majority of us, this will be a good challenge. I challenge you and myself to not find, but to make time for one full hour sometime this week and eliminate all of the noise for that hour. You can sit in silence, you can hum a tune, you can read the word. I would say, because I don't consider this noise, you could take on and play some praise music, because I think that's atmosphere, and just listen, talk to God. Some of you right now are starting to twitch at the thought of that. I can't, no, I can't do that. Wait, I think you can. I, I, I really think you can. The question is, will you? And may, maybe, maybe at the beginning, like maybe for the first few minutes, it's going to be really awkward. And you're just going to be like, uh, uh. but perhaps once you get past that awkwardness, you'll just settle in. And maybe by the end of the hour, you're like, man, that was so restful. That was so beautiful. I, I think I'm going to try that again. Just one hour, sometime in this week. For some of you with younger kids, I I get it. Noise is all over the place. Uh, Some of you, your jobs are just like racing from the moment. So we have to make time. Either we're going to have to get up early or we're going to stay up a little bit later. But we have to make this time, but just find a spot where we can eliminate the noise and eliminate the distractions for an hour and just be. You say, well, what do I do? No, just be. See what happens. Meditate. Talk to God. Listen to God. Read his scripture. This, this is this thought process that he's saying, lead a quiet life. It doesn't mean like, all right, we walk in the house. Starting tonight at Sunday at 8 o'clock until tomorrow morning, Monday at 8 o'clock. Nobody says a word. Ready? One, two, three. Shh. That's not what he's proposing. But it's quiet, restful, settled, undisturbed. And then if you do that this week, I'd love to hear about it. Seriously, shoot me an email. Find me at church next week. It's Easter. There'll be tons of people here, but we'll be, like, I'd love to hear, like, I'd love to hear what you heard in that hour of quietness and just being settled before the Lord. Two more. I'm just going to mention them. He says proper behavior is minding your own business. (laughs) I thought about titling the message, mind your business. Uh... We should be, as, as Christ followers, we should be more about the Father's business than our neighbor's business. That's all. Just more about the Father's business than our neighbor's business. Like, get out of their life. 
Now, there's a fine line here, right? Because we're called to love our neighbors. So that means to love our neighbors, we need to know our neighbors. To know our neighbors, we need to have an attempt at relationship with our neighbors. But I think there's a fine line with loving our neighbors for the purpose of just loving them because Jesus commanded it. And there's another thing with like, oh, no, I'm loving them because I want to know all about their junk. There's a big difference between those two. And Paul's like, hey, as simply as I can put it, just mind your own business. (laughs) What a great word. Just mind your own business. And then finally, he says, proper behavior is working hard. It seems so like, yeah. But there may have been some people in this church we'll see in next week's passage. They like got all excited about the return of Jesus. And they said, ooh, okay, quit working. Just everybody stop working. And everybody, let's just sit down. Let's just wait for Jesus to come back because it's right around the corner. Well, here we are like 2,000 years later and we're still waiting. And so Paul's like, yo, no, just work hard. So here, here's, here's my interpretation of a few words that came to my mind from this, even this morning as I was reviewing this. First, get a job. How do I say it a different way? Get a job. Uh, make a living. Don't live off of someone else. Stop mooching. Make your own way. Don't depend on someone else to take care of you when you can take care of yourself. Now, there are seasons of life and things that happen in life, right? Medically, physically, emotionally, sometimes things happen. And for a season, brothers and sisters and family comes along and help us. But the general approach is if I have the capacity to take care of myself uh, and to provide for my family, then that's what I need to do. It's that simple. Don't be a burden by being lazy. Don't be a burden by being lazy. And so I found this quote, to put it bluntly, an irresponsible, lazy lifestyle discredits the gospel. Have you ever considered that Jesus wasn't lazy? Jesus came with a mission. Jesus pursued his mission. Jesus kept the mission before him. He, in fact, even said, I must be about my father's business. He knew what he was here to do, and he went after it. He also took time to be quiet and just commune by himself alone from all the distractions with his father. What a great example Jesus is for us. As those bearing Jesus Christ's name, we need to be among the first to work with our hands, provide for our own, and maybe even earn some extra to be generous to others. What a wonderful thing. So, simple, proper behavior, kingdom conduct, Loving one another, leading a quiet, restful life, minding your own business, minding my own business, and working with our hands. Do you know how simple that is? So I hope, like this hopefully, like maybe encourages some of you that like, well, I can't really do anything because I just don't have enough knowledge. I I need to take some more Bible studies and some classes, and those aren't necessarily bad things. But the simple thing is, like, you can live this out right now, right here. By loving each other, loving one another, just working hard, minding your own business, leading a quiet life. And Paul says, this is a reflection of the gospel to those who are outside of the faith. May we be found faithful in doing this. And this is something I believe every one of us have the capacity to do. And if you think you don't, that's the power of the Holy Spirit at work inside of the followers of Jesus to live this out. And if we live this out, then outsiders, those will see, they, will, they, they might ask questions, they might press in with us, uh, and it's just a simple opportunity to say, man, I don't know all this stuff, I'm still learning, but gosh, can I just tell you something? That guy named Jesus, like, he changed my life. So what you're seeing is not of my own doing, it's like I'm being changed. And I invite you to come to Pine Hills Church and hear the story of the resurrection of Jesus, and maybe he'll save your life too. Like they, just like it's that simple that we have the capacity to do this. And the whole reason that we do this and live this out is because that the gospel changes lives. It changes lives. 
So we, want to, we just want to see as many lives touched and changed with the gospel of Jesus. You say, whoa, all right, Duria, what, what is this gospel of Jesus? This is all new to me. The gospel means good news. And the message is this, what we believe according to the scriptures, that Jesus Christ was first the son of God, that he came to this earth born through the Virgin Mary. Therefore, he wasn't tainted with the sin nature that he wrapped his divinity in human skin, bones, flesh, and blood, that he lived a life that no one else has ever lived, and it was perfect, and it was sinless, which qualified him then to be a death that was a sacrificial death for those of us, all of us who are sinful, that on the cross that we'll celebrate, yes, we will celebrate the cross, even the suffering of the cross on Friday, that in that moment, he bore all of our sins in his body, that he physically died, that he was placed in a tomb, that for three days, he His cold, lifeless human body lay there, but on the third day, according to the scriptures, resurrection life entered his body. He took a breath. He rose. He's alive and well. He appeared to hundreds of people who recorded it, even in the scriptures today that we have. And then right before he left, he said to his followers, hey, I'm leaving, but before I do, like, go and make disciples, people who follow me, and then I'm coming back. But until I do, stay on point, be on mission, and tell people about my immense love for them. Goodbye, I'll see you, but I'm sending the Holy Spirit to give you the power to live this out. That's the gospel. That's the gospel in two minutes. That's what we believe. That's what he invites you into. And we are so passionate about this that that we have just taken up a vision here at Pine Hills to plant other churches that will carry that same DNA and teach that same type of gospel.